Good, my name is Michael Case, and I'm with uh, PR Consulting. Um, what we're going to be talking about is something called Laudan. Um, Laudan is a distributed state machine framework. Uh, this talk will be primarily conceptual. Um, we may talk a little bit about some code and some problems that were solved with um, parsing messages and, um, and continuation but I'm not sure that we'll actually do that. Um, so I think it's okay. um, this will be a good video. I'm going to get, give you a sampling of some of the areas that not necessarily Laudan has been utilized, but, it, but in essence, Laudan has a long history. And, um, and so this first picture is actually, or slide is from a commercial product where I stole lots of ideas that I worked on um, in the mid-90s. And um, it is a system that is utilized in semiconductor manufacturing. It um, does all kinds of stuff. The idea of this is just kind of give you a, an idea of what, places where the framework might be interesting. Um, it had an IRX based SGI machine, a whole bunch of SBCs running. Um, they were running mostly VxWorks. There were stages, robotic arms with um, you know, 10 different axes, things to grab masks and flip them over if they were upside down, and all kinds of wacky things that were moving. In and doing stuff. Um, a lot of coordination between different soft elements of data moving around and things that have to happen. Um, these two things over here, we, we used to tease, we were really actually in the, in the job of making supercomputers. This one actually had 4,000 processors in it. Um, most of the things we did had um, either custom ASICs or um, our own processor. Eventually we decided we thought we were going to use strong arm in this one. <laughs> 4,000 strong arms, that was interesting. Um, and um, the end result is, is this framework is utilized not just to coordinate the soft things that were moving around, but lots of um, mechanical motions, lasers, and things of that sort. Um, and it was during this time, those of you who know me, I, I've become some of, somewhat of a, um, a spirit evangelist um, for Boost. Um, <coughs> Maybe it's just my role in life is to be evangelizing something. And back then, it was it was this thing called Room, and we'll talk a little bit about Room before. But it was the real-time object-oriented modeling um, that we did object-oriented modeling back in the day. Okay. Um, the uh, I, it was fortunate. The uh, there were a bunch of Canadians, but they had a office in the Silicon Valley, and um, they were French Canadians which happened to be my, my background too, so it was almost like bonding. And they just let me hang out and drink coffee and learn about everything about their product. Uh, <laughs> great. So um, then, because everybody has to have their own startup at some point, my first startup was a, a, a company that did um, digital video systems. But the interesting thing here that um, we care about for this was it's this event-driven video system. Um, it had just Intel-based computers, um, looking at 4 to 16 video channels of input. There was a lot of coordination between lots of systems on networks, um, typical TCP networks. There was also coordination between systems that were on funny multi-drop, weird wired networks. Um, it had some interesting um, external triggers that needed to be known. An example is um, sniffing networks to see bank um, traffic, trying to decrypt that enough that you can understand what's going on so that you can capture video based upon events that are happening within the, the bank branch. Um, or uh, we have actually, crazy enough, still systems that are running um, at CMEX, which is a um, second largest cement company in the world, where trucks come on, they get weighed, um, cement gets dumped in them, they continue to get weighed, Somebody goes over and presses the button that says invoice, and then they put some more cement on, and um, then the truck leaves. So uh, the system detects theft by monitoring video, monitoring a lot of external inputs, such as what the scales are measuring, 
um, different types of things of that sort, so external sources coming in. And again, all of that was um, then controlled by the state machine or these distributed state machines. Um, the, uh, this one, because Java was very cool um, in 2000-ish, uh, we have Java versions as well as um, our first C++ version that we, we had implemented with them. Um, so another case, at some point, of course, startups fail. Um, and then I worked a little while at a company that did ground-based weather equipment. And here's an example of a place where um, I utilized it on bare metal. So we had no operating system. Um, and the idea is that it doesn't really matter. The concepts that we're talking about will just map to the things that we need them to map to. Um, so inside of this box, or the purpose of a thermometer is, um, this was probably my favorite project at this company, <laughs> shoot up a laser, and, and then up to 40,000 feet, you can measure the backscatter of the laser to try to determine um, how high clouds are, the depth of clouds as the laser, laser goes through it, what the scatter looks like, the moisture content, weird things like that. So it's a lot of signal processing. In particular, this was running on a cold fire processor. It had one mega flash. We were very excited to get one mega flash. In 64K RAM, no OS. A CPLD is a lot like an FPGA, if you know what those are, except that they have larger building blocks. Um, so there was a lot of coordination with um, all the bits and pieces that I had also put on the board. Um, that's what I have together. Unlike probably most of you here, I'm, I'm one of those electrical engineer guys, so, um, <laughs> some of us. Uh, so, um, I also did the hardware designs um, for a lot of this stuff. But the, um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of things on the hardware that need to be controlled. Um, timing bits, um, different things that you want to conceptually think about as another state machine running, you want to coordinate these as they're moving around. Um, so there's signal processing algorithms, and then there's a lot of communication out of this box with other devices. And this was the first place where um, I had implemented using Argo UML, which is a um, free open source UML um, program, to take and you can actually draw the state diagrams and, and such, come up and abuse something called, um, we'll, we'll get there, you, you could abuse some of, of UML, because it's easy to abuse, and then um, the output is an XMI file, which is a standard format from OMG, and then um, convert that with a code converter into things that just run wherever they need to run, and in this case, it would target directly against the, um, the, the bare metal. <coughs> So the next thing we did was this project in which the um, purpose of, of a visibility sensor is it's utilized to measure visibility. So when you can't land at an airport because the visibility is low or bad weather conditions, it's typically because this device is telling them that the airplane can't land. Um, so these different um, heads both emit things and detect things. There's um, a whole variety of environmental concerns about uh, certain elements have to be kept at certain temperatures, so there's control loops. Um, in fact, the previous one with the lasers, there's a whole set of control loops about <coughs> cooling the laser to keep it at optimal temperatures in the optics as, as well. Um, there's uh, obviously a bunch of signal processing that occurs, so in addition to processors in these four heads, there's another um, set of processor, another processor down below. Um, and then the processor down here is communicating to a bunch of stuff that, that's elsewhere. Um, this was the first place that we had implemented something called targeting uh, or coloring, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it was also the first place that we had runtime communication binding um, of the sort that, that this one has. And um, as it would run, it would create real-time message sequence charts. We had put in a lot of diagnostic capabilities so that we could just look at messages moving places and get message sequence charts out at any particular time, as well as um, then the state machine that it thought that, <coughs> that was being ran would recreate. Is like cold fire some variant of ARM? No, cold fire is, um, cold fire is free scale. <coughs> so what happened was Motorola became free scale at some point. Mm -hmm. 68000 was a pretty popular device. Um, a lot of people utilize it. It's an architecture that's similar to 68000. Okay. Um, however, it's not. Um, and it has 
Cold Fire in, in particular has a lot of signal processing type <coughs> things that you would want also on the chip. And so you can do a lot of um, high speed things that you would typically use a DSP for, mm -hmm. and you utilize a Cold Fire for. They have a whole family of them that have things re from um, Ethernet Mac type things to mm -hmm. Mac as in multiply, accumulate, faster encryption type engines built into them. So in that sense, it's like ARM where there are a bajillion flavors of it, but yeah. they're offered by one person. Uh, they don't sell their cores enough. Um, all right, this perhaps my, my favorite project ever. Um, so another guy and I worked on this thing to basically do subtraining and mapping by um, creating an EM wave and then measuring um, the response back from the EM wave out of the ground. And based upon various things, you can determine everything from what's down there or what's not down there and what it's made of. So yeah, there is a piece of granite down there and it's not just granite, but it's composed of these particular elements. Um, and the uh, US Army had various reasons why they wanted it. <laughs> this one has a full four cold fire processors in it that span throughout here. Um, we were less lucky, but I guess this is my fault. I could have picked something better. I, guess. I only had 256k of RAM and 32k of RAM. There was no OS, um, so it was a little bit more of a challenge. But the concepts that we're going to talk about still hold true, and um, the idea of wanting to to do this. They were self-organizing um, on a bus that we created in order to handle the type of data that was moving through here. It had to control things such as EM field generation, signal collection, uh, signal processing. There was a lot of different um, bits of electronics that had to be controlled in order to do the right things at the right time. Time synchronization throughout here with jitter control. Um, we would sync with the GPS, but we needed um, 10 centimeter accuracy, so our clocks needed to constantly be re resynced with each other. And so it's something that state machines had to take care of somehow. Um, and they also handled the multi-drop time division communication. Um, so now I'm kind of seeing a span of like pure software stuff to now some more hardware stuff. Um, so here's, a, here's another place. This one <coughs> is, has a PC that's running Linux. And um, this is a, um, a medical device that's used when you're doing knee replacements. Um, and funny thing about medical companies, not only do they want you to design and make the hardware work, but they want you to figure out how you have to calibrate these things so that they're repeatable when you operate on people later. Um, so um, what we have is, in essence, Laudens running um, in small bits in here, which was a trick, because this has 4K um, of RAM. <coughs> That's not true. This has 4K of flash, and it has 256 bytes of a stack. Right. <laughs> um, so that was a real trick. Um, the, uh, there's all kinds of, then, unfortunately, I, I couldn't get a picture of it. There's this pneumatic press that comes down and applies pressure at different points on, on, on this and takes some measurements. And so there's you know, coordination between these pneumatic presses and coordination between different sensors and feedback loops for um, um, different parts of, of the system. And um, those end up all being controlled by a lot. And eventually, somebody wants to see this stuff. Um, so there are um, middleware layers running Node.js that happens actually in JavaScript. We have a lot in JavaScript version. Um, that needs to coordinate a bunch of activity between things as weird as MongoDB instances, um, barcode scanners off to some other bits, um, some systems that are actually located in different cloud um, instances. And so this coordination between different things at different states um, is also done through that. This was the first place that um, I fused <coughs> the, uh, both Qi and, and Karma, which is Spirit, use spirit along with protocol um, generators and in receivers, how you describe protocols. So if you were in my spirit talk two years ago and I talked about both spirit and the asynchronous I.O. libraries and we were talking about some things that you could do with spirit, it was actually that something that came out of the original work from this project. Um, 
the idea is that if you have a bunch of things that are communicating with each other, it'd be really convenient if you could just describe that as some grammar. And um, so, you know, I, I had the previous year fallen in love with spirit, and so why not describe everything as spirit grammars, right? And um, so you simply describe what your protocols look like as spirit grammars, and then you can connect these things together, and they know what to do, um, whether it's on wire or on networks or things like that sort. Um, all right, so then, this will be our last one, but we'll show videos so you don't all fall asleep. Um, so then we did this weird project. Um, it's a glass sorter, and the idea is that you dump, you dump garbage. Well, let's talk about the specs, and we'll talk about what it does. So <laughs> it's just a PC. Uh, in essence, there's a PC running Linux, um, and it's controlling a firing sequence of these 800 and 64 um, jets of air. Um, it's controlling a line scan camera. It's controlling the DMA access and the memory transfers that are going on there. Um, it actually is doing within the state machine processing. It's doing the image processing algorithms because of the timing that's required and making sure that things are occurring when we need them to. Um, all kinds of conveyors that are moving around and actuators and sensors and just all kinds of junk that has to happen. Um, and then there are all these physical and logical protocols that we have to deal with for talking to these things. You know, you couldn't actually have a, a way to talk to conveyors because that would be inconvenient. So um, you have to have like 12 ways to talk to conveyors. Or you have to have, everybody has their own whatever. And of course, then we designed um, most of the control software, so we came up with something completely different because that would be more fun. Um, so this system then, it, is also utilizing um, what was really the, the beginning of the movement to, to Laden um, and more modern C++ um, and starting to get a lot of the improvements that are in modern C++ versus what was written in 2000, which is very Brady Bush looking and uh, has lots of weird stuff. Um, all right, so. This one's fun, so we'll, we'll take just a moment to talk about it. The system does four-way sorting. Um, what that means is they dump literally trash on a conveyor belt um, at seven and a half tons um, per hour, which works out to be, in essence, four crushed wine bottles a second. So, um, and this thing just dumps it on, and the conveyor belt throws off as it runs. Um, the material falls off, and as it falls off in midair, there's a line scan camera. So a line scan camera basically is a camera that only can see uh, one line of pixels, and it sees basically 2K of pixels across. And as the, um, the material falls in front of it, it keeps scanning that, and it produces an image. Well, that image, um, I, I caught it was the yawn in the stretch, I understand. <laughs> um, that as that image is getting produced, um, it's going to hit, this is a row of air jets, um, and this is the end of the conveyor. So from here to here um, is basically the amount of time that we have in order to make the decision of what to do with this material that's coming down. Because we're going to fire these air jets to separate the material by four ways. Either clear glass, um, brown glass, or green glass. Those are going to go into three different chutes. And then the rest we're just going to say, that's trash, and just let it go. And so from here to here is, in essence, our hard real time. Uh, it's in a sense, soft because not really bad things are going to happen. But it's hard in the sense that if we miss it, the data is completely useless. And um, that's this flight time from here to here is five milliseconds. So we have to figure out within five milliseconds everything that we're going to do with uh, almost 900 air jets, meanwhile while controlling everything else, right? So that this becomes a a problem that, as you're thinking about it, you would like to figure out how to deconstruct it. And, and that's what we're going to talk about, is how to deconstruct it. In essence, it works out to be about 4 million pixels, just over 4 million pixels, that we process each second in order to figure out what our firing algorithms, need, or what our firing sequences need to be. Um, for example, um, you, you make these decisions every 5 milliseconds, but you know, glass, by the time you see it, it's maybe it's small or maybe it's big. So you need that firing sequence to cover the whole piece of glass so you make sure you really push it into the chute you want. 
might have, you know, maybe a beer bottle with labels still stuck on it. By the time we get it, everything's pretty much crushed, but now you're going to determine, is, there a, is that a label or is that really trash? Um, so, it's, uh, some things are better seen than done. Talk about it. This is what trash looks like. <laughs> <coughs> Kind of hard to see, but I, I like this because it reminds me of I Spy. You can see here, here's a bottle cap moving along. Um, and then it's moving back because it hit something. It's really annoying. This, is, this was our very first video that we took of trying to figure out, oh, I like the sharky. We were trying to figure out um, what we call the manifold system, why it wasn't quite working the way we wanted it to. Nothing, Nothing works the way it does on paper, right? That's why you're an engineer, because you don't really believe the stuff that comes off the calculation, and you go and do it. Um, and so we were having problems with the flight path and things bouncing all over the place. And so um, what, what you're going to see, unfortunately, are bad videos in that sense. Um, this one, you'll kind of get an idea of what the system's doing. Um, we're setting up a grid of red and green um, little pieces of plastic. They're just target pieces so that we can understand how well we're firing or not firing. And so th this is kind of tilted. The conveyor's over there, and then things are falling down this way. Um, it's just the way that the high-speed camera works. Um, th this is just a camera that we have on the side so we can try to get an idea later why things don't work. Um, so here's the first manifold set of air jets, here's a second set of air jets, here's a third set of air jets. And what you're going to see is, um, as it's detecting it, some of the red items are getting picked off and shot down the first shoot, and some of the green ones are getting picked off and shot down. The idea is that all the red ones go in one shoot and all the green ones go in the other shoot, and if we mix that up or make it wrong, then we screwed up. So this is an alliance game. This is not the line scan camera. The line scan camera is looking down and detecting these. And so you can see the green are getting picked off at the front. Oh, I guess this is the green only one. So the green's got picked off and the red's just moved on. And you, and you can still see it's kind of hitting stuff and bouncing around. But um, for those who didn't see it. So that it looks like the reds are going to keep going, but you're going to see the greens are being picked off. You can kind of see them being pushed down there. So that, that's the idea of what the system does, but it does it with lots of stuff really fast. Um, and, and it's not nice, pretty plastic pieces. It's very smelly trash. You want to go somewhere and work somewhere that's horribly <laughs> disgusting? <laughs> go install these things, man. It's gross. <laughs> All right, this um, this was our first run, so it's going to look horrible, but you get the idea. So this is actually real material being ran through. You can kind of see some of the stuff is getting um, at a higher velocity pushed one way than the other, and um, things are bouncing around and stuff. But um, a large part of all of this control is occurring through this framework. Um, at some point, we, once we decide what the firing sequence is, we load it in to a set of FIFOs that are being controlled by um, some FPGAs so that we get that right. <laughs> but, um, but the rest of it is really all just logging based software controlling bits and pieces and stuff. Um, not so interesting anymore. Just like trash. You can watch that. You know, I used to sit around but quite mesmerized by stuff. Just <laughs> and it would be fun. Like everyone's like, there's a sprinkler head. <laughs> you know, how does that get inside the trash stream, right? <laughs> I don't know. This stuff is really bad. All right, so this is actually it running. Um, and so that stuff's falling off, in theory, in somewhat of an organized way, um, flying through the air and then sorting out green and brown was there, clears in the middle, we actually aren't sorting anything in that one, and then this is just whatever fell off. This is, the system wasn't working. This is our very first run. Um, so the, the result was pretty bad, 
but um, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on and see it, you know, see it doing. This is about um, about a tenth, maybe a um, tenth of the material that really runs through the system at full speed is what you're seeing there. So. Um, why do I tell you all this? Well, I tell you because there's all kinds of different ways that laudanum ends up getting used by me, um, and and I, you know, I get excited about it. <laughs> um, but it's not necessarily just software; it can be um, software and hardware. It can be mixes of the two. Um, so let's talk just for a moment why you might want to use a state machine. Um, your system might be reactive; it might be um, event-driven in some sort meaning that most of the time it sits around and does nothing. And by most of the time, we mean like computer time, right? It's sitting around doing nothing at all. But every once in a while, it has to do something, and it has to do it correctly and very quickly, and in a deterministic manner. Um, I use the word plainly deterministic because I knew the people inside here wouldn't mind if I used that word. Um, I was expecting somebody to go, what does that mean? So I'll just tell you what. I, to me, what it means is that if you look at a state machine diagram, a hierarchical state machine diagram, you know what state you're in, things are going to happen, and you can look right away and say, what's going to occur when those things happen? I don't have to worry about all these different branches of code, I don't have to worry about lots of things going on, I want, I want the end result to be plainly deterministic. I'm in a state, I receive an event, and clearly I take that path. <coughs> or clearly I didn't handle it. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, so I, personally, I think they're easier to reason about. Um, Jeff and I have actually talked about this before. It could be our double E backgrounds. Um, but it, it, I believe it's for a lot of systems, state machines are much easier to reason about than you know, these crazy other things that get created that are in essence state machines. Um, so whether it's lots of if statements or switch statements, or even asynchronous I.O. callbacks all over the place, right? Handlers that are, are just one after another after another um, and stacked together that those types of things eventually become hard to reason about. and it's hard to make a system that's very deterministic and does what you want every time um, and then it, it forces you to con consider errors um, you have to think about what's going to happen when what what occurs when bad stuff happens when with the um, the, the first machine the mask machine you know, what happens if somebody goes behind the machine and pulls the servo board out when it's in the middle of running? Which the smart aleck director did, you know, in the middle of the clean room to see whether or not it recovered and did the right thing. We, we work really hard in coming up with a generic way to model recovery systems. Um, and it was easy to reason about as state machines. It was hard to reason about other ways. We had failed for many years. Um, to reason about it in a, in a generic manner so that the system knew bad things just occurred and how to recover and what to do about them. If you just think small, let's just think about that problem for a moment. I have a stage. It has X and Y movements. I have a robot that does things. I have something that's grasping the thing that, that's being moved around in X and Y. I, I don't want to think about the whole system when bad things occur. I just want to think about maybe the X or the Y or the thing grasping. If I, can, if I can break things down into small components and say, what does this have to do? What, what does the thing that's clamping the, you know, the $50,000 photo mask, which ends up becoming the, the, the um, negative for printing the wafers, what should I do with that clamp when somebody pulls the servo board out or when, in essence, something bad happens? And, and because you can think about it at a smaller level, you can probably think about doing the right thing. Um, so, how many of you in here use state machines? Oh, wow, great. <laughs> where, where do you guys use them? What, what kinds of things? Process control, Pro information, this is ready, that's ready. Okay. Now we're ready to send this out. Yeah, okay. Process control with information movement. Most parsers are state machines. Yeah, parsers are state machines. Client server interactions. Client server interactions, and, and at what level? Client server interactions. Uh, like, um, if you've got uh, the protocol for how events are supposed to take place, you've got a distributed uh, program, basically like a video game. You've got multiple people doing stuff at the same time. Yep. The server has to coordinate between them. You need to know what state everyone's in. And like you said, if one player goes down a video game, you need to know 
what to do to the other players or right. if that's recoverable and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, communication protocols. Communication protocols. Enumeration mm -hmm. and initialization. And mm -hmm. Okay. Robotics. Robotics. Awesome. My passion. <laughs> UL. Embedded systems. Embedded systems just in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Image analysis. Image analysis stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then is it the coordination of, of the bits and pieces within the analysis? Is it yeah. real time or like is it a object detection tracking? Okay. Yeah. Right. Anyone else? No, I'm actually looking for as much of a full sampling. So if you if you use a statement chain, I'd love to hear what you do with it. Okay. Um, so I sadly, from my point of view, I think it. State machines typically get used in two places. Um, we heard some of those here, but in essence, it works out to be communication protocols and trivial machines that have like a dozen or less states. Um, and, and there's a reason for that because as soon as it starts getting to be a whole lot of hierarchical states, it starts getting to be hard to think about um, again. And, and you end up possibly with um, doing things that you, you probably shouldn't. And we'll talk about, at least in my point of view, some of the things you probably shouldn't do. Um, all right, so uh, for some reason this is actually really important, uh, <laughs> the brief history. And part of it is because it helps you understand why Laudan is what it is as opposed to actually UML. Um, so real-time object-oriented modeling, um, there was a book that was published in 94. And um, it came out of a telecom in, in Canada. It was spun out from that company to become a company called Object Time, who then promoted this thing called Room, and um, they promoted the whole entire methodology to everything from aerospace and defense contractors to people who were dealing with telecommunication to people who were doing robotics controls. And they were just trying to grab a lot of different people who had this concept of having to distribute um, processing and, and do them in a deterministic way. Um, Room. There was this thing back in the day called the OMG where you bring stuff to get it accepted. And um, they were dealing with, in essence, um, modeling standards. And in 97, um, in essence, UML was getting voted on. And IBM and Object Time had paired up together and decided that they were going to create, in essence, a real-time version of modeling. And um, it was going to be room. And they were going to the OMG with it, and it looked like it was going to get voted in without any problem at all. It was like hands down. As you can imagine, people like Brady Bush did not like this. Um, and so Rational bought a controlling part of, of object time. And um, the end result is that what got accepted, in essence, is almost room, the initial acceptance. Um, but they called it UML real time. And it's been messed up since then a little bit. but. Um, the end result is that when you look at UML2 real-time things, so you're looking at the state chart stuff, um, you're looking at, let's say, Boost MSM, which is fairly compliant. Um, when you're looking at those types of things, you're looking at what's very close to room concepts, which were based upon Herald state charts initially. Um, we, I wrote the first version in 98 of our Java version, and then in 2000 released um, a real-time suite that was based upon C++, and um, decided to rename myself because object modeling designs is a really bad name in 2012, finally. Um, so I have a new name, and then Laudan is basically a rewrite into modern C++ of that. Just shut the thing off. I don't know what's doing. <laughs> Playing music problem. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, this it's stuck in that state. Um, and Laudan is going to end up becoming open source release. And I was hoping to do that. That was the plan was to do it at the conference, and we just didn't get all of our ducks in a row because there are a lot of ducks. And um, so this is something that will probably happen before the end of the year that the Laudan framework will be released um, as an open source project. Um, so where does it come from? Um, Laudan is actually a hundred head dragon in Greek mythology that guards a, um, a tree of apples. And um, the interesting thing from my point of view of why to pick this for the name is that each head um, is rumored to speak a different language. And um, as you maybe have noticed from my presentation so far, I deal with a lot of things that speak a lot of different languages and protocols 
and need to be distributed about. And so this seemed like it would fit. Besides Hydra, everybody uses Hydra. <laughs> um, all right, so the concept inside of Laudan primarily come from Rome. Um, the main concept is very boring. It's called an actor. Um, we'll just call it, we'll, we'll draw it as a box. Yes? Um, does what you call an actor have any relation to what, like, parallel, an actor model and parallel programming before? I actually wouldn't know. Okay. That's the double E part. <laughs> um, you can tell me afterwards, though. So an actor, the terminology is primarily terminology that was stolen from Rune. I mean, you can actually still get the book on Amazon. If you wanted to go and get it, it's a thick fat book, it's purple. It has all the same stuff, more or less. Um, the idea, though, of an actor is to divide things up in a structural view and a behavioral view. Um, the structural view describes containment, um, and it describes ports. Ports are communication mechanisms. Behavioral views describe um, things that are going to happen over time. And we're going to describe those using state machines. So we have, with our structure, we have containment. Um, this actor can contain another actor, which can contain another actor, or contain several actors, a collection of actors that need to be coordinated somehow. Um, and then these ports. Ports can be conjugated. Um, well, let's start off. Ports implement a protocol. So every port on an actor um, understands a protocol. And protocol is a set of in and out messages. These are my sets. Uh, my set of in messages. These are the set of out messages. It's very clear what the, what that port can receive and send. Um, messages consist of a signal and a payload. This is if, you know, Artos would kept putting up Haskell, I, I could put up like a JavaScript thing real fast. That's like, you know, this is what it looks like. This. But in, in like C++, if we think about MSM, um, how many of you are familiar with MSM? Maybe we should talk about state turn instead. Okay, so if you're familiar with MSM, then this, in essence, is a type. The signals are types in MSM. And the payload, in essence, is whatever's inside the structure. So if you defined your message as, as being a struct. Um, and then ports can be conjugated. What that means is that whatever was in and out is now out and in. Um, and so the concept is that you're going to describe very particularly what goes in and out of a port and what this port expects to go in and out of it. Um, and then at the code generation time, we can actually check a lot of this stuff to make sure you haven't messed up or done something you shouldn't. Um, and code generation is now moving. Code generation occurs in a couple different phases. Um, more and more of it's now code generation at the compiler time than it was previously. A lot of the code generation was just making code. Um, all right, and then ports are bound together. And this, this is at runtime, is where the binding occurs. So these, in essence, would no longer be an actor or like a struct or a class. These are now instances of it. And at runtime, they're bound together. Behavior is just um, hierarchical state machine. So, a um, variety of different states. It's going to describe what behavior we want this thing to do. And um, because we have different ports, unlike um, most state machine concepts that you think about, we can describe that a transition is going to occur when an event occurs that was a signal that came on a specific port. So if I have like four ports, I might want this transition to occur only on a signal from a particular port. Actors um, then pass these messages. They send the messages out of port. Um, And so here's a, a simple protocol. It has an in of ping, out of ping, in start task, out start done, task done. And so one of them will be sending, and one of them will at this moment be receiving. But one of them is conjugated, one of them is not, depending upon who is 
is doing the, the enzyme. Yeah. Which way is in, which way is out? Um, it depends upon the conjugation. So I think, at the moment, I think I was calling this conjugated okay. in the drawing. So this would be, um, from the protocol point of view, right. uh, ins would be start task, it would be receiving them, outs would be task done. Okay. And then when I start a port over here, I said it implements this protocol, but the conjugation of it. And again, these are just terms that, that they used in room. Right, just yeah. continue to steal them. And the messages are assumed to be queued? So uh, depending on whether there is a state awaiting that message or not, are they queued or thrown away? That's a good question. Okay. Um, I think we're going to get to it in the next slide. Okay. <laughs> kind of. A lot of, this, a lot of this we'll just be talking about the slide. But um, all right, so here we have a very simple set of <coughs> states. An actor would implement the state machine, um, and luckily it uses just standard UML notation. So this means that when this thing starts up for the first time, its initial state will be to transition to A. A has substates. What does it do when it first gets into A? Well, it has an initial state, so it's going to be in C. So when this thing first comes up, um, its state will be C. When we get, when we're in C and we get um, a signal that is go, so it's an event, um, we will transition from C to D. If we got stop, we would transition back to C. Let's say we got go and we transition um, to D and now we receive get it, which is this thing here. It's a hierarchical state machine. And so um, hierarchical state machines have very specific rules for searching how to match events against transitions. So how this works is it first searches, it's always inside out. It searches all the internal transitions that could occur inside of a state. So first we're going to search everything internal. Do we have a match? No. We search everything external. Do we have a match? No. We pop a level up of hierarchy if we have a level. So from D, we're popping up a level, and now we're searching all the internal transitions of A. It doesn't have any, but we're searching them. Internal transitions of A, do they match? No. External transitions of A, do they match? Oh yeah, it matches get it. And so I can transition to B. So even though I'm in D, it doesn't have a direct transition out of it, but the higher level state does. And so when I get get it, here I am in D. So I'm sitting around in D. And um, so in that process, did you pass <coughs> through the A state at all, or do you just go directly to B through that logic? We're in uh, the right back to that. Um, so we're, we're in B, and we now get got it, and we transition back to the, the containing state A, the higher state A. The question is now, where are we? C. Who said C? We're, we're actually in D. And the reason is because that's where we were when we started. Don't you need a history state for that? So, um, no. <coughs> um, you, you don't need a history state for it. Um, this is the initial transition. Um, and you return back to D because that's where you left. But you left state A in the process. And when you enter back, you enter back into state A. Yeah, but see, UML messed everything up. <coughs> So the standard behavior is always return to history. Okay. So the standard behavior is return to history. Um, all right, so Ray asked a great question. I'm in D. And, and when I got get it, what actually has occurred as I pass through these states? Well, a state, in addition to having internal transitions and external transitions, it can have Entry code and exit code. So um, what, do you, what do you want to do as you enter the state? And what do you want to do as you exit the state? And that's the primary difference um, between why you may want an internal transition versus an external transition. Internal transitions ensure that if they're taken, you're <coughs> not going to exit any exit code leaving and enter entrance code coming back in. So let's take this example that we have. We were in D. Um, and we're trying to match get it 
Well, we've, we've exited D. So if D had exit actions that were going to occur on the exit, so exit code, those are going to be um, executed. If A has exit code, that will be executed. As we enter in B, if it had entrance code, that will be executed. When we came back in, we're going to come back into A. We will execute A's entrance code and D's entrance code. Yeah, I, I think just just wanted to clarify it. Yeah. When he asked that question, I think what has to be um, understood is that when you're in D, you're also in A. You're in both states. Right. Time. So. Um, <coughs> so when you left D, you you stay in A, and then you left A, and then you went to B. That's basically what I'm saying. Right. You know. So I've seen it. I've seen it thought of that way, or to me, you're in A state. So I can't be in A and D. Okay. I'm in D, but D happens to be contained by A. Now this might be just a mental model on the way like I think about the problem, but um, and, and you'll see in a little bit why I don't like the idea of being in multiple states. And it has to do with orthogonal regions. Um, but it, if you're in D, you're in D. The fact that it's contained by A, those behavioral rules that describe what that hierarchical concept means, right? So does this mean that you're effectively either in C or D, but you're never in A as such? So that's my mental view okay. of life. Um, now, if you were to pick up UML literature and read it, it actually describes this as you are in both D and A at the same time. You're in whatever that hierarchy is all the way down. I think your model works very well as long as you keep in mind what egg entry and exit actions will fire. Correct. So you are in D, but you just keep in mind that when you, you're going to have to exit A and those trend, those functions are going to fire. Correct. So that's the that's the that's how I think your your thinking works. Okay. I I appreciate that feedback because um, that will help me here in the future. Hopefully, oh, adjust. <laughs> um, yeah, it, so what, what's interesting about it, though, is even if you think about it as I'm in D and A at the same time, you still have to worry about the fact that you've exited both states at one point, and both of your exit, whatever that is going to occur, both of them both of them are going to occur, right? You're going to get D and A's exit, and you're going to get it in order. D is going to occur, and then A is going to occur. Um, it's very deterministic. It's kind of path like you know? It's, it's, it's path like Right, so I, I mean, I, this, so... For me, this model works really well of actors and things, because to me, it's just chips sitting on a board with lines, you know, with traces between them where I'm communicating back and forth. Um, and the fact that um, we're, we're transitioning, you know, I can only mean D and I can only move to A, um, works well for my model. Yeah. No, okay. Um, this is maybe a dumb question, but, but you, you said you, you do D's exit. When you go from B back to A, yeah. do you do B, B's exit code before you do A's entrance code? Absolutely. Yeah. Not just that, but you do B's <laughs> exit code, and then you do any action that happened to be on the transition here, followed then by A's entrance code, followed by whatever. Um, okay, so. Let's say now we're in B, and we get stuck. I think that was somebody had that question about queuing and message. So um, conceptually, if we get stuck, we can't handle it. So the way we are, the way we are right now, we're we're kind of toast, right? So we received an event for a state that we haven't described a transition for, and and life is just over more or less. And so um, in Laden, we have. Um, and as we call it top, once you once you make it to the very top searching, um, and you didn't find a match, and you know I, I say that as if it's this process of really searching, it's not quite that. Bad. <laughs> but you make it to the top, there was no match. Um, there's a handler for it. What you do when things are bad, and you can set default behavior, which is do whatever the handler is and just go back to where you were and pretend like it never happened, um, which I don't recommend. Or you can do something about it, which is probably probably better. Now, a, a common thing to do about it is um, at, the, at some top level, and we can even just say at B. This is going to be something very simple here. At B, I'm going to have an internal transition called stop, that will take stop. And when I get that on the port, 
that it was received, I will defer that message. And so there's a defer queue. As messages come in, I have to, I have to reason about what happens when this message comes in. Oh, well, okay, it's okay that I'm in this state, this message came in, I just can't handle it right now, but I know I'll be able to handle it later. I'm going to defer the message. And so you shove it into the defer queue by calling message.defer. And in a way, is the defer queue kind of a global service then? It's um, completely dependent upon implementation. Okay, but I mean, you, you often think of it that way. Um, I think of it as, when I think of it, I think of defer queues per actor per port. Because conceptually, that's how we want to think about it. By the time things get generated into code, some of those systems, almost all those systems, um, if it's all running on the same process, they have one queue. And there's one machine down there that's basically taking care of all the actors at the same time, right? It, and it has one defer queue, and it knows how to handle that and, and to get things back when they need to be given back. Now, you say you deferred that, that stop signal, and yep. I assume at one point you're transitioning back into some, some internal state of the A. When will that get picked up? As you get into A or as you get into D? No, neither. neither. It gets picked up when you tell it to get picked up. Okay. Yeah. So um, we've deferred it into the defer queue, but we get to control when we want to process the defer queue again. Um, and so in this example, I would want on my entry code within A, I would want to recall from the defer queue. And all that really does is it tells the machine at the bottom, what in room we call the controller, um, it tells this thing, <coughs> If there was stuff on the defer queue, you can stick it back into my normal message queue of things that I'm going to be receiving again. <coughs> um, in Laden, we also have the concept of searching. So you can recall, but you can recall something specific. I was here in A, I'm sorry, I was here in B, and my entry code for A, because I know that things might happen out of A, like somebody asking me to stop that I didn't handle somewhere else. I can say recall stop, or maybe you want to be more specific in D, recall stop. So if there are any stop events in, my, in the defer queue, those will be recalled and stuck back inside of the normal processing queue again. Um, so you'll be a little more selective about what you're bringing back in to, to process. Because you know at this state, these are things that could have happened that I, I didn't see while I was there because they're locked somewhere else. Yeah. <coughs> Does that have hold the potential for um, moving events out of order that they were received on a given port? Um, yes, it does. Absolutely. <coughs> yep. So if that's a concern, you you want to recall them differently, right? But they're going to be out of order anyhow since you start deferring things. I was just going to say, I think it's different than MetaState Machine, where as soon as you got back to D, then it's a process. That's correct. Yeah, so MetaState Machine, if you defer something, it will automatically recall it for you when you get back to D and stick it back inside of it. Yeah, there, there's been some wiggling, Christoph and I talk a lot, about how to get MSM to do what I want <laughs> underneath the scene. Um, any more questions about this? It's all good. All right, then let me just talk for a moment about orthogonal regions, and because I see this at, I see this with a lot of different clients, um, and it and it might just be me and it bothers just me, but um, what has ended up is typically I've, I've gotten called and I'm at the client site because they can't figure out how to untangle something, right? And they don't call me otherwise. <laughs> they didn't call me to start off with. Um, so, and the untangling problem almost always at the moment seems to be associated with orthogonal regions. And um, this comes back to my simplistic view of life. You are in one state. And orthogonal regions break that completely. What an orthogonal region means is um, this outer state has two regions. And within this state, I can actually be in A and D at the same time. Well, that, that's really nice if you want to think about parallel processing of some sort, but it suddenly becomes incredibly hard to reason about again. Um, I now have a state 
that has lots of states, right? Th this state has the combinatorial of all those other states. In my point, from my point of view, and in, in, in essence how Laudan's designed, this is bad for another reason. When a message comes in, um, I want to handle that message. I want to handle that event from the state I'm in. So let's, let's pretend that stop came in. Well, stop actually needs to be, or is going to become available to both A and D. So that stop event that came in, it's, it's almost like it comes in and it gets distributed through this fan out, right? And so all the states that are inside of your orthogonal regions get to act, act on it if they want to, or if they can. And so what people end up doing a lot of times is they use these orthogonal regions in such a way that they're trying to create the concept of parallel state machines. These are machines that are, are doing things um, at the same time. <coughs> so conceptually, they start thinking about it that way. Don't do that. If you, if you want a distributed state machine and you want different state machines that are working with each other, do that. Don't use orthogonal regions. Um, the, the test case that comes up a lot of why we use orthogonal regions ends up being, um, I think, like the standard you know, textbook thing when you open it up. It's great for error handling. I don't see how it could possibly be great for error handling. So I, I'm in, um, let's say I'm in state A and state C. And I got an event in, this is, this is my main course of movement here, this A thing. And I would like to transition to B, but what I got was something that was error related. And so I'm going to handle it down here and transition to D. Well, let me ask this, is it valid that you're in state A if this error has occurred? What I see most of the time with orthogonal region implementations is it actually isn't valid that you're in state A and the errors occur that you're handling in D. So you shouldn't model it that way. You probably shouldn't implement it that way because at the end it becomes hard to reason with again. And, and you start pulling in error handling um, and mingling it with your normal operational um, behavioral. So um, the end result is uh, while UML allows orthogonal regions a custom. <laughs> Laudan happens to allow them um, if you tweak the back end because it, it does use UML standard um, state machine, but the front ends, if you were to use the graphic interfaces, it won't co-generate an orthogonal region because it, it just assumes that there are so many different ways to do it and not have problems, you should probably pick one of those. I'm glad to hear you say that because I could never figure them out either because you have to figure out okay, what events are supposed to fire in what order. Yeah. And it's it's like it's not clear. Yeah, so I, um, I mean, to be honest, it this disappoints me uh, um, quite a bit. Brand Selleck, who is one of the authors of the book and creators of the book, um, works for IBM and is in essence their evangelist for real time UML. And he was um, at least his papers are largely involved in orthogonal regions. And I mean, back in the day when I used to talk to Brown all the time, he would never have thought of something like this. I mean, it's just, it's so counter to your ability to handle um, some, time, some real time machine in which you need um, very deterministic behavior and you need to be able to go and reason about it in an easy way. I think it's just kind of a way to wallpaper over exceptions. You know, like we <laughs> <laughs> you, can draw, you can draw exceptions this way. Maybe. <laughs> um, what do we have for time? All right. Um, we'll talk just a little bit about some of the implementation details, really more than the architecture. Um, so we talked about actors. Actors, you, in some way, you can think of them as like structures or classes or descriptions of things that are going to eventually be instantiated. Um, when, yeah. Can you? connect an actor to something physical? Yeah. I, well, what I'm asking is, does it represent a, a PLC control? Or oh, yeah. I'm sorry, that, that's an incredible good question. Um, yes. So if you think about that glass sorter, PLC controllers that had multiples inside of the system, it had um, all kinds of wacky controllers, a lot of which we made and a lot of which were somewhere else. Each of those controllers that I'm talking to um, on a functional level was modeled as an actor. 
that provide certain services, right? So um, the conveyor was, was really easy. It's running or not running. And the other thing I can do is set its speed. There's not, there's not a whole lot more, right? But that's the whole idea of, of this concept is that you break things down to really small um, things that you can reason about. So while that was easy, um, I don't have a blackboard. I call that operational. This is where you spend most of your time and you think about your application doing stuff. Um, I also call that stable state. Once you've arrived there, things are great, right? But it takes work to get there. So um, I'll just call this your, your power up. You've started here. Um, maybe you want to initialize and you have some configuration that needs to occur. So you init and you config. And then from operational, I've just always wanted to write on chalkboard. This is really what it is. Um, from operational, maybe bad things occur and you become unavailable. We have we have a concept of what's called resource management, which is that PLC controller is being modeled by this actor. Up above that is something else, likely which um, would maybe be the conveyor. The conveyor can only work if that is available to it, right? And so we call this resource management. What actors have to be available for me to do my job? And if you can clearly state that, um, even at runtime, what occurs is if an actor becomes unavailable, you become unavailable because you can't do your job. And then you can describe rules at a very high level of these are, the, these are the things that have to be available for me to be able to work and do what I want. And if something bad happens to one of them, everything else responds properly. Um, and that's just kind of built in. So we, we design our systems where we have this how to get to stable state and stay in stable state, and then what to do in stable state. So while this is almost always trivial, coming up with a generic way to solve the rest of it is a lot of fun. Um, so at some point, you want to target this somewhere, and um, we use a mechanism we call it coloring, and they actually, I don't know exactly where it came from, <laughs> but you, in essence, go through and you say, these actors will eventually become, um, they will live in, in similar areas. Um, so we we'll back up for, for a moment. Remember, between actors, we have these bindings between their ports. Those are, those are primarily described at runtime. You can describe them at, at compile time um, in certain containment relationships that make sense. But in, in an essence, it's at runtime that you want to describe that. Some of those bindings might be across a network. Some of those bindings might be across other really funny things. And so, how many of you are familiar with Corva? Okay, some of you are. There's this like, concept of name brokering, right? Figuring out where the thing is that you want to connect. We, we don't have that, but we have something similar to it where there are name services and you can figure out the actor that I want to connect to happens to be over there and then that stuff will occur. All, all of that management of how to get things to connect um, and handle the, both the physical and the logical connections between them occurs um, at code generation and the control down this level called controllers. The, um, and in order to do that, we need to know a little bit of information. We need to know where you want them to live. So at the moment, you want, want them all to live on your computer right in front of you because you're doing simulations, or you're debugging, or you're just working on it right now. Later, you might decide that this particular actor that controls the PLC, I want it to live over there because that's where the PLC happens to be. All the other actors are local, so they have the same coloring. That one has a different one, and the coloring also describes the target, where it's going to cross-compile to, and um, the communication mechanisms that need to physically occur, and then it will co-generate for that. So you say that you have the binds of connectors, you, you decide them at runtime. Yeah. Um, do you only do that once, or is that something where you can do that dynamically throughout the lifetime yeah. process? If you wanted to move an actor yeah. in the middle of some... You can absolutely do that. So 
actors um, actors can be um, created and destroyed um, at any particular time. They can be they can be shells in essence that implement protocols. They're like placeholders, right? And then you can instantiate the actor at runtime as you're initializing. You can say, oh, I have this hardware available to me. I'm going to instantiate these particular actors and bind them, or they know they're binding by that point, where they need to get bound to. So can you and you can do runtime binding too, in which you destroy a binding, mm -hmm. and then you reconnect a binding somewhere else. Can, and so you can, can you achieve fault tolerance by, say, you have some action that becomes unavailable, something else is going to become unavailable because it's become unavailable. Can yeah. you just rebind? Um, right. Can, can, can you just rebind some new actor to of the same type you, to achieve some sort of fault You can re rebind. We actually we use something like that for, for that. We're, when we have situations where we have fault tolerance that concerns, and we actually have, let's, let's just say we have two physical single board computers, mm -hmm. um, we'll have basically the same actors running on both. And when one, one, only one is responding, so they're both receiving the messages, but only one at the moment is responding to them. And as soon as one goes unavailable, the other one then kicks back into operational and takes in where, where the other one basically left off, right? So um, that's how we model it. Very cool. But you could do the other. Mm. You know, you could reinstantiate a new actor and bind it again. Um, so controllers often communicate to each other. The idea of the controller is to abstract away these, these things of an actor. So let's think, um, you know, the, the original example, which I for some reason still love, is um, when my wife was pregnant and having a baby, she was having a baby for a really long time. Now, it depends upon where you live. You know, I mean, if you live in the house, it was a really long time. If you lived out of the house, it seemed like it was a short time for some reason. But um, um, but having the baby occurred at a particular time. So most of the time she was waiting around. We were all just waiting around. Waiting, 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 For the event to occur. And then the event finally occurred, right? But there was a lot of waiting involved. Or a bus. You stand around waiting for the bus for a really long time. But then the bus finally arrives. Most of the time, state machines are sitting around doing nothing at all. They're just hanging out, waiting for something to happen. And so actors, um, the idea is you want actors, in essence, to share a processing thread. Lots of actors share a processing thread. Um, actors are not a processing thread. They could be if you needed that, but you probably don't. You probably need um, some asynchronous event handling. That's what the controller is. The controller takes and all these different actors that it happens to be managing, it figures out who has events and it hands them off. We use a run to completion semantic. So if I'm in C and I receive the event go, I basically execute from C all the way to D. And when I arrive in D and have finished my entrance code of D, then the controller can take up and figure out what has to happen next. And it then hands off the next thing to the next actor who's supposed to get something within that queue. So in essence, what we have is a scheduling system, right? Which is why we run on why we can run on bare metal. And it looks a lot like we have threading. We don't, obviously. We kind of do, but we have interrupts too. But, um, in a lot of cases, people create threads all over the place because they want this concept of asynchronous control, and so they have threads, um, which really doesn't do the trick, right? You want something else that can handle that for you. So in our version that will be open source releasing, a lot of this is handled by the asynchronous I.O. library. Now, it just so happens that the asynchronous I.O. library is really clever, right? And so from an implementation point of view, this, this actually works out to be an I.O. service. So each color or each controller is an I.O. service. 
a lot of other things that are there too for facilities of um, watchdog, um, timing facilities and things of that sort. But there, this is an asynchronous I.O. thing. This is an asynchronous I.O. thing. Asynchronous I.O. things, if you've used them before, you know that you can actually have multiple threads running against the same I.O. service. So within, um, within here, we could, if we wanted to, have multiple threads running against the thing that's green colored at the moment. All right, we then also have these things, we call them service access points. Um, they end up becoming <coughs> tricky protocol things in essence. So these, these two colors, the blue and the green, in theory, these controllers are running within the same process. Um, and the way I know that is because they don't have service access points. Service access points are mechanisms for um, inter-process communication or communication and mechanisms that are not going to be within the same, the same process itself. So that was not well described. <laughs> if they are, if they're in different threads and things like that, the system will handle for you. But if you're leaving one process and going to another, you just you get to describe what the service access points look like, and and how they behave. So I want my service access point to be shared memory. I want my service access point to be a TCP connection, a UDP connection. I want my T my this service access point is actually a multi-drop to an RS-485 link. It's something special USB that I have. So service access points provide these physical ways to start binding communication to each other. And you could have a whole bunch of them within this color if we need to communicate out to another service access point at the same time. Does that make sense? Uh, you answered my question. Okay. All right. Um, So at the modeling level, we don't worry about that. We just worry about that I have an actor, it has a port foo, I want to send out ping, and then I just worry about when I get ping back. So when I'm designing these things, I design my actor that way. And then when I go ahead and instantiate them, I instantiate some of these actors, and then I tell them how they're going to hook up with each other. They're going to bind this way. This is, this is what I want you to create. Um, and that's still conceptual, largely. And then at some point, we color it, and we say, I, I want a little more detail here. I want these to run on these certain processor types. I want these to run across, I want um, these particular ports to be bound across these types of communication mechanisms, so that these are on 485 and these are on something else. Um, so there's like these three steps. First, you want to just think about things generically, then you want to think about your system and how those generic components work with each other, and then finally you want to physically target. And the physical target part is fun because since it's the last and the rest of the system is somewhat independent of it, obviously timing constraints and stuff, it lets you do some really cool things, which is um, that that system that had the four, here. so the system that had those four heads and it measured visibility, these heads ran out somewhere, you know, they're on these process, certain processors running a cold fire, uh, 8251 or something like that. And this was um, one that was also somewhere else and it was running in. These communications paths were across some proprietary crazy bus, of course, because we can't use anything that anybody has. Um, and then this, to make all this work, on the hardware was going to be a pain in the butt, right? So initially, you just target it to your PC. And you make sure that my states transition properly, my algorithms do the right thing, my messages do the right thing. I can start going in and injecting bad messages, seeing how it behaves, uh, change, change some timing of certain aspects to see how that works. But I can do it all with on, within my computer. And then when I go to finally target, um, Hardware, I don't want to work with all the hardware at one time. Maybe I just want to work with one head. These three heads were simulated. They just stayed right there on the computer. This one actually got to go on, on real hardware. And then we just put the you know, uh, um, a logic analyzer on the bus and we watch to see, okay, first, does the communication work right? Woohoo, communication doesn't work. All right, let's start working on that part, right? 
And it gave us a way to know that the state machines, we had pretty good confidence that the state machines did the right thing before we targeted out parts of the hardware. How, how do you deal with, um, with communication leaks that aren't reliable? Oh, yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, communication links that are unreliable end up becoming some, some behavior that you want that gets implemented in that thing called the service access point. What do you want the behavior to be for things of that sort? Um, okay. So unreliable communication is completely domain specific, right? I, I might not care. In fact, I have, maybe I've picked an unreliable source because I don't care. Uh, I, I'm using UDP because an occasional message I get, that's fine, that's good enough for me. Messages come so often and they're so frequent and they're just being blasted from some source that if I just get one every once in a while, I'm happy with that. That would have been the... Um, so that, that becomes eventually like an implementation level. And so the service access points the idea is you implement there are like these sets of commands, right? That have to be implemented to get a service access point to plug into a controller so it knows how to use it. Okay. Um, those service access points, um, are, are, can you uh, change what they're connected to dynamically, similar to how you can change what the, the like? like um, no, not really. And the reason, um, so conceptually, you can't. And the reason is is that. Uh, I'm happy to you know, do different things, but <laughs> service access points, let's just say that these service access points for handling TCP communication, right. um, they, and they're distributed across a bunch of computers on some network. Right. When um, this actor wants to bind to another very specific actor mm -hmm. and its specific port, and when it does that, there is a, there's some way of name resolution in the system for it to figure out where this thing is, and then it creates that binding, right? right? So the binding is created at the time where you describe what your system is. Right. Um, now, if you want to bind somewhere else, you can do that. But you actually are going to tell it, you know, disconnect my binding and put a new one in, okay. or add another binding. You know, the ports can have, you know, zero to n connections. So. <coughs> not a problem with that. You can have multiple things that you're, you're talking to, which is what this picture basically is, right? There's a single connection here and multiples out. But I, I, just, I just meant, like, if you lose an entire, like, uh, you have uh, some hardware that's got some actors and the controller and service access point, and you just kind of lose that sure. entire hardware. Can you have some other hardware that's identical to it that, that can come into place? If oh, um, yeah, so... What, what it would do is, in essence, it would replace at the name resolution. Okay. It's now the name, it, it has those things, okay. right? Those, those objects now belong there, or actors. Those actors and bindings belong somewhere else. Okay. Um. Okay, let me just get curious the status real fast. Um, so the, the lot in C++ and the lot in JavaScript will get released probably the same time um, because they're both being used in the same project. Um, my suspicion is that it'll happen now before the end of the year. Hopefully it happens in two months, but um, it may, that may not, may not occur. Um, lot in JS, I should have grabbed it. So if you're familiar with, with MSM, it's basically we've implemented MSM in JavaScript um, because, not, not exactly MSM obviously, right? But you can create what looks like MSM code in JavaScript. You can create your tables and stuff. And, and the reason is we, we're interested in thinking about problems at an actor level and how things respond to each other, things that have to get controlled, and then be able to deal with those concepts regardless of is this thing running in Node.js is this thing running on somebody's browser? Is this thing running actually down on real physical hardware with no OS? Is this thing running? That coordination task often is the same. Granted, there are some obviously real constraints that can occur, and that tells you where you have to target things. But sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you have coordination in activities that occur. We have one, for example, right now where we do a lot of coordination between a lot of different bits and pieces and systems, and this MongoDB and some things that are out in the cloud. 
And it ends up that it actually makes more sense to have that instead of the C++ target where we had it, it makes more sense to have it in the JavaScript target running on Node.js for our particular application. And so we've retargeted that there. Um, so so the, the, the JavaScript and the C++ versions can interact? Or? The code generator will generate. Okay. So yes, oh yeah, they, they, they interact completely. So, and the JavaScript side, you say what you're binding to. I'm binding to this instance of an actor within this port. And on the C++ side, you can say the same thing, and it will get resolved to wherever they need to be. They connect, and then you literally just say port dot send, and then if it's a data type with the structure of the payload, no, let's just say it's foo, right? Make sure you put your extra prints in because you're not running C++ 11, but you put prints, you know, foo, and then somehow they get a foo signal on the JavaScript side. Yeah. Will you address at all this, uh, the structure of the message when you talk? Unless it's we're out of time, I think. Um, so the structure of the message, like, um, the nature of the message, I should say, the nature in a more generic sense. Yeah, so generically, message, a message always contains those two parameters, um, a signal and a payload. Um, payloads are optional signals, aren't they? Signals are implementation detail uh, of what a signal is. So in C++, a signal is a type. In JavaScript, it ends up being, for example, that it is a value associated with the, the hash of an object, the signal, something. Um, that's how you deal with them in your code. Once they hit the wire, which is the example thing we were going to go over. Once they hit the wire, you, you get to describe what the actual physical protocol and, and um, logical protocol look like, right? And how um, the way that we're doing it right now with all of our stuff is we describe a spirit rating <coughs> for that. We say, uh, so on C++ side, sending things out is karma. I have received a structure. I have a grammar that tells me how to take this structure and convert it into a bunch of bytes. Those can be, you know, we often think of parsing and generating as text things, but they don't have to be. And so there's a grammar that describes it. When it receives this, how to convert it into the, net, the other thing. So if you're using LaDAM and, um, and you want to use like the stuff that's just there, you literally say um, that at that physical level, at the, at the SAP level, that this thing is a, um, that this thing has a grammar that looks like this going this way, and a grammar that looks like this one's coming this way. And you get to describe those in spirit grammars. And then it just takes care of, in a sense, marshalling things back and forth, right? Um, what did you do on the JavaScript side for that grammar? I mean, did you just have some, like, how do you do the person or the so, on the JavaScript uh, side? The JavaScript side just sends JavaScript over. Okay. And it sends it across TCP. On the other side, it takes the JavaScript, it converts the JavaScript into the proper struct, mm -hmm. and then off that goes. Um, JSON, right? Pardon me? J JSON, you mean? When you say JavaScript, you mean JSON? I'm oh, sorry, JSON. Right. That's, that's why you, you've, you've been working on that JSON parser. Right, so we, um, we have a JSON parser that will actually be open sourcing. It's actually even more than the parser, right? The parser's trivial, and I'm not too interested in the parser. Um, to me, the JSON library is of interest. I, I want to treat JSON like Python, like I treat JSON in JavaScript. It's just easy to work with. I don't want to treat it like all these crazy C++ semantics that we use to work with those types of, of objects. It, to me, it just doesn't make sense, right? And so I have, um, and the, the JSON parser, or JSON library will be released this month. And then next month, we have a YAML library also that we'll be releasing, and they're, they're almost interchangeable if you start using one library, you can almost just say I just want to do that one. So if, if you want, if I don't know if you guys put your name on the thingy, a thingy, did you guys sign up for shirts? I never sign up for shirts. How do I get one away if I'm going to sign up? You, you skipped that part. Yeah. yeah. That was your oh, last oh, time. Oh, it was too early. There. Okay. Everybody, right now, real fast. <laughs> Go there. You don't have to put your email, so don't feel like you have to put your email. But put, at least put your first and last name so that I can give a shirt away. <laughs> Five of them.
And then if you put your email, we're just going to use it for sending out information about when we're having our open source releases. And then we do, we do training and we'll let you know about training. Oops. But the open source releases are to me. Man, I just suck at that. Oh, yeah, all of our stuff will be open sourced under um, <coughs> this license. And um, oh, I missed the C. The YAML parser um, was, just so you feel more confident about it, was partially written by me and partially written by Joel Baker. So, um, now you can feel better about the parser. <laughs>